Good morning. Um, my name is Linda Green, and I'm an anthropologist at the University of Arizona and the director of the Center for Latin American Studies. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce um, Judith Maxwell. I've known Judy for many years uh, since we both work in Guatemala, so certainly since the 80s. So we've had a long history together in Guatemala. Now, um, Judy is the director of the Interdisciplinary Program in Linguistics at Tulane, also an anthropologist. She received her PhD from Chicago in 1982 in both anthropology and linguistics. She speaks multiple indigenous languages, uh, Nahuatl, um, Kachikel, among many others, Mayan languages. Um, she has been a Fulbright Fellow in Guatemala in 2009 to uh, 2010. She's taught in Salvador. She's uh, taught around the U.S., of course. Uh, she's certainly a, a welcome and guest speaker at many important issues with regard to language, language immersion, and, uh, in indigenous languages. Um, she has, she's a prolific writer, many publications, and they really, it was really interesting to take a look at her CV and see the range of work that she does, not only from an introductory text to Kachikel, which I'm happy to say we're using at the University of Arizona as we have our own Kachikel language program going on, but also she delves into some of the issues, for example, ownership, who owns uh, ownership of indigenous languages. So she really publishes not only books, but many journal articles that really span the range of understanding about uh, the issues with regard to indigenous intellectual property rights, as well as how to teach uh, these kinds of uh, issues and languages. She's also at the Stone Center for Latin American Studies, where for over 20 years she's run an extremely successful summer of field school in Guatemala on Cachiquel. So, it's with great pleasure I introduce you to Judy, and the title of her talk is Pulsating Galactic Classrooms, Immersion Environments, Individual versus Group Language Learning at Home and Abroad. Thank you, Judy. Uh, what I wanted to share with you today are uh, some experiences from the Kachiko class that uh, Linda Green was just mentioning to you, which is a, started as a course that um, we run in Guatemala during the summer. It's uh, a six-week program. And one of the issues, the main issue that I want to address is uh, interculturality, but perhaps from uh, a different perspective uh, than some of the perspectives that we've been talking about here. I just wanted to spend a moment on the title Pulsating Galactic Classrooms um, because I feel it's an, uh, too much of an in-joke. But um, the idea of pulsating galactic classrooms is based on a notion that uh, Stanley Tambaya came up with for southeastern kingdoms. Uh, as southeast as in the globe, not, not Georgia. Uh, so, like Thailand. Okay, and uh, there, see? Okay, Marvy. Um, okay, moving right along. So, uh, his point was that you have these polities that are based, first of all, on ideological principles. In the case of Southeast Asia, uh, we're talking about the mandala. And he notes that these polities, there he has the uh, ones that he was talking about, are pulsating in the sense that given particular economic and political and historic consequences, they expand and contract. And this idea was borrowed by Arthur Demarest, who is an archaeologist who works primarily in Guatemala, and translated to explain the rise and fall of the hiatuses that happened in classic Maya civilization in the lowlands of Guatemala and also to a degree in uh, Yucatan. So I'm importing this idea to the language course that I teach and uh, starting with the idea of an ideological underpinning. So Kachikel is a Mayan language 
So the ideological underpinnings from the point of the Maya are based on Maya cosmograms. I just put up some iconic figures here. But then, of course, there are also ideologies from the point of view of the United States. Because uh, you probably know that Tulane is also a Title VI a center for Latin American studies. And the initiative for this course came from the Latin American Studies Center. They had routinely been including as part of their proposal to the federal government that we teach indigenous languages of the Americas. And one year, they, were, they would put it in year after year after year and it was never funded. And then one year it got funded. So they called me in April and said, could you teach a course this summer in an indigenous language? And I said, sure, what language? And they said, oh, any language. And I said, okay, where? Oh, anywhere in Latin America, which is great. It was absolutely great. And uh, I started working in, in Guatemala in 1973 with a group called the Proyecto Linguístico Francisco Marroquín. And uh, what that was training indigenous people to be linguists so that they could create their own materials, uh, linguistic materials, dictionaries and grammars, but also teaching materials for the schools. And the Proyecto was centered in Antigua, Guatemala. Those of you who know Antigua know that, yeah, that's all right. So, uh, and we as gringo linguists were discouraged from going out to the communities because the people we were training were to be seen as the language experts, not only by us, but by their communities from the beginning. So I went as a guest, I went as a visitor to the communities, but the linguistic work from the beginning was done by the people we were training. That being said, the proyecto was in Antigua, and there are lots of indigenous people in Antigua. Of course, back in the day, there weren't as many as there are now because the tourist trade wasn't as robust. But, so the majority of the people were Kachikel speaking. I was working on Chuch, which is spoken in northwestern Huehuetenango, about as far away as you can get and still be in Guatemala, and Ishil, which was also not that easy to get to, and it was the 70s. Uh, so, uh, I was really frustrated when I would walk out in the street, people would be speaking Kachikel, and I couldn't speak to them. I could speak to them in Chuch, and they'd go, huh? Speak to them in Ishil, and then they'd say, oh, you've got funny retroflexes, I don't know what that means. Uh, so I really wanted to learn Kachikel. So I chose Kachikel because I wanted to learn it. And the first year uh, of the course, I kept a day ahead of the students. It was very exciting. Um, and from that beginning, that beginning started, I think, kind of like a traditional study abroad language program in that the students were all gringos. And uh, although one was from Guatemala, but she was studying at a U.S. institution. They uh, were all gringos, and they were going down to learn an indigenous language. And we had a huge advantage. I want to say this about the course. I'm not going to talk that much about the structure of the course, but I do want to say this about it. Um, we have an advantage that most courses don't have, in that we have a one-to-one -one teacher student uh, ratio. So if we have 10 gringos, then we have 10 Kachikel speakers. That doesn't mean that they have little tutorials and run off and sit by themselves in a niche, but it does mean that we have uh, enough people that we can have real interchanges going on. Uh, but this first year, uh, the teachers were, of course, you know, the way you get teachers, because I'd worked with the PLFM people, you talk to the Kakchikel linguist who'd been in the PLFM, he goes out and hires all his family members, and then you have a core of teachers. And so in, the, in this idea of pulsating, over time, we have spread out from that original core of the teachers who were all related to Kaplahuch Tihash Martin Chakach, and now we have teachers from eight different communities, which is important when you're dealing with this kind of indigenous language because uh, Guatemala is a mountainous country, the Kapchikel live in the mountains, and it's clearly true that every valley has its own variety of Kachikel. 
But it's, it's worse than that. There are two communities, Santa Catarina Barahona and San Antonio Aguascalientes. They're separated by a street. I mean, that's exactly, and they speak really different. Uh, and they act as though they can't understand the people from across the street. But, you know, really they can. But it's important for the students, oh, those are some popos, which are uh, big ants that come out in May and are delicious. So, uh, yes, okay. Meanwhile, back at the classroom. All right, so uh, we have expanded our teacher base, covering more communities. And this will become important in a minute when we start talking more about ideological basics. We've also expanded our student base. I mean, that first year was gringuitos, to say it that way. And since then, we've had students that come from Europe. We've had students that come from Japan and Korea. But we have students that come from Guatemala. And these students from Guatemala are interesting because the first Guatemalan students that we had would be what um, one of the prior plenary speakers referred to as heritage speakers, except they were heritage non-speakers. That is, they were Kachikal by descent, but their parents had decided to save them discrimination and therefore had never spoken to them in the home in Kachikal. So these were people who are now adult and are finding it for work, for um, being able to be authentic for tourists, for getting jobs with the government, or for teaching. They needed to speak their heritage language and didn't have it. So we got our first Guatemalan students were heritage non-speakers. And then we got the first Ladino student. For those of you who don't know Guatemala, the big divide there is between indigenous people, which, who are called indios if you don't like them, and indigenous if you do, uh, or kalinak, which is our people, and the Ladinos, and I'm not even going to go into the whole history of why they're called Ladinos, and it doesn't have to do anything with Sephardic Jews, so forget that, but Ladinos. And Ladinos are basically either white folks or people who've rejected Mayan cultural identities. And there's a, a huge gap between those communities. Uh, in the early days of the course, we had two of the teachers come up to Tulane and give little seminars, and there was this big open forum for the Latin American Student Association, and uh, this Maya man and Maya woman got up and talked about their individual specialties, which were agriculture, weaving, and teaching, and uh, it was clear from their speech that they weren't very fond of the people on the other side of that ethnic divide. And of course, the audience at Tulane, which is a private institution, was uh, Latin American students who were from the 50 families in their country. So they felt attacked by the speech. And they said, but you know, we should all work together. We should be one nation. And of course, the man who was very diplomatic said, we would love that to happen. And then the woman, who was very honest, stood up and said, I have never met a Ladino I could trust basic problem. And then we got a Ladino in the course. This was a huge thing. The poor guy, the first couple of classes, the teachers would teach him and they would call on him. But when we had those moments where you go to eat, as you saw, when you go out and play basketball after class, he never got invited. But he hung in there. And he formed a rock group and started wearing Maya traje, unfortunately cross-gender Maya traje. But uh, he was doing things to break down barriers. The next Ladino we got was a 50 families scion in the class. And they couldn't do enough for him because he learned the language very well. And he got chosen to be the Caballero, the escort for the woman who won the indigenous beauty pageant in their town. And even though the caballeros never speak at these pageants, 
They engineered the program so that he could speak because they wanted to show the world that Ladinos could actually speak an indigenous language and speak it well, and we're indigenous Traje. He broke so many boundaries by taking that course. And since that time, we have had Ladinos in the course every year. Now we have an arrangement with the Universidad del Valle de Guatemala, and they send one to two students a year to the Capchiquel course. So this is a, a huge uh, logro for the course. Okay, um, I wanted to talk about other things that we've been able to do. Uh, one of them has to do with language standardization. Uh, those of you that teach languages uh, that have already been standardized know how to spell things, you know where word divisions are, and you can deal with the kinds of dialect differences that every language has because there is something like an accepted standard. Even if you're teaching Arabic and there are lots of variations in that, there is a standard, right? But we're working in a situation where the standard is emerging. And so we work very closely with Kachikel Cholchi, which is the Kachikel branch of the Academia de las Lenguas Mayas de Guatemala, which is the institute that was uh, set up after the second Congress on Alphabets. You don't want to know all that. Uh, anyway, we work very closely with them to be giving the most up-to-date version of what the standard language is going to be. And of course, that sometimes means from one year to another, we're not teaching the same thing because it's an emergent standard. But why do this? Uh, why do this at all? Why not just teach a local variety? The reason for that is, first of all, we can't, all of our students aren't going to work in the same towns. So we need there to be comprehensibility that goes beyond that. Secondly, there is an emergent literacy as well, so that there are newspaper articles, there are books, there is a book on uh, Maya spirituality that is like 240 pages, completely written in Kachikal. There are books on Maya um, philosophy that are written bilingually in various Mayan languages. And all of these things are written in standard. And in fact, when the newspapers print something in Mayan languages, the big four newspapers in Guatemala, they send their, their proof to the academia to get it vetted that it's spelled right. So it's important to us to be supporting this idea of using a standard language. Uh, I wanted to spend a little time about talking about the offshoots of the program. And of course, you have to figure, you know, what's, you can see why for business you would want to study Chinese, or you would want to study Spanish because there's a huge market. Kachikal, very small market uh, in Kachikal, Landia. So the people who are wanting to study indigenous languages are usually people that are supporting social programs. Uh, occasionally we get the linguist that just needs it because it's a non-Indo-European language. But we often get people who are very socially involved, and they've gone on to found institutions which we look at as our daughters. Uh, so we have um, a physician who has founded Bukawuk, which is a clinic that attends people in indigenous languages. They now work both in the Kachikel and the Mom area. In one of the preceding slides, there was a uh, Maya man from Chimaltenango who has founded an elementary school in which all of the classes are going to be entirely in Kachikel. And he is a heritage non-speaker, so he needed to get on top of the language because he was going to have him and all of his teachers teaching only in Kachikel. 
there have been a number of schools that have been started with this plan to teach in Maya languages, and we regularly accept in the course teachers from those institutions who come to us to A, learn our methodology for teaching language, and B, to learn the standard, because that's what they're going to have to be teaching. I would you know, just point out that the, a former vice minister of education for Guatemala, Joaquin uh, Ramil, Demetrio Corti Cuchil, wanted to take our course, but he couldn't get off from the Ministry of Education because it's six weeks all day long. Uh, so he sent his daughter. So she came and did the course so she could teach her dad the standard so that he wouldn't have to write all of his official stuff in Spanish. So he could, in fact, write and write educate, educatedly in standard Cachical. And then his daughter uh, retook the course for her own sake the, the following year. And I would also point out that we have uh, various U.S. connections for this course. Uh, so Linda has already pointed out that the University of Arizona is teaching Cachical now. No, I can't take credit for that. Uh, but I am happy that they're using our book. Uh, not, not that I get any royalties, you know, but it's good to see the language being taught here. It's also being taught at the University of Kansas, and there there is a direct kind of lineal descent. The first teachers there were former teachers from the, our Kakshikal course, and the current instructor uh, is also an alumna. In addition, we have students from our course in the United States who are now teachers in elementary schools in the United States. And they have formed partnerships with Kachikel schools in Guatemala so that they have exchanges. And of course, now we all know that the internet is a wonderful thing. Uh, so that kids in New Orleans can Skype with kids in Pachali, Chimaltenango and establish relationships using Kakchikel. Uh, and this has importance not just for the Americans who come back with this skill and the ability to interact in positive ways with communities, but it also has importance for the communities in which we work. And I want to just give you a couple of examples of that. So. Um, at one point, we were having a ceremony for the course, and I started talking to the man who was the daykeeper, the religious specialist, and he said, you know, I became a daykeeper because of you. I said, really? Because I just like met him the year before, and he was already a daykeeper, so you know, I didn't see it. And he said, well, you know, your class, because we travel from communities, and we're kind of like a circus when we travel, because we have 10 to 12 students with 10 to 12 instructors. So when we hit town, you know, it's a show. And we stay, and we stayed in Tecpan, and we walk around, and we're clearly speaking Kachikel to each other, to people in the streets. And this man had previously been a soccer player, played semi-pro uh, for one of the local teams. And he was watching us walk around in his town speaking Kachikel, and he didn't really speak. And he said, what's this? We have these gringos that come from who knows where, coming to our town and speaking the language better than I do? Now, this can't be. So he gave up his soccer career, came home, and became a ritual specialist. Um, so that's when it, this is my compadre. He is also a daykeeper, and not to offend anyone, but he is the guy that did the cleansing ceremony at Ishinche after Bush's visit there. Uh, just saying. OK. Uh, so uh, another way in which we have uh, interacted with and uh, given back to the community is besides providing this example of people giving importance to indigenous languages, which is a huge thing uh, in Guatemala, we have this thing called a clausura, which is the party at the end of the course. 
And uh, Rashche, who is the head of a Maya publishing company, Chol Samach, came out regularly with a video camera and videoed our klafsura because the gringos stand up and give little speechlets in Kachikal. And then he, he, but he not only filmed that, he filmed the dancing and the eating afterwards. And then he showed it on the Mayan language TV station that the Academia de las Lenguas Mayas has. And then I asked him, it really, why? Because, okay, it's, it's mildly amusing the first time to see gringos speak in Cachical, but why do this consistently? And he said, because it shows in the whole party that Mayas and non-Mayas can live together and respect one another. And he said, this is something we don't have here, and it's something we desperately need. And so he films us every year. And I try not to warn the students, because then you get the stage fright. And I once had a woman stop and not say anything for a whole minute. You think that's not too long, but when you're on film, the minute is deadly. OK. Um, Another example, to go back to my compadre, whom you saw in a prior slide, we were working on a research project on the Maya sacred sites. And uh, he insisted that I bring some students from the course with us, mostly to have enough people to discourage uh, bandits. And we went out to this altar. And he also thought that we needed a vehicle so that we could do this research better. And so he made each of the students get up on this huge rock that was shaped like a saddle and do a uh, little ceremony with him, drink moonshine and smoke a cigar. One of the students who was there was one, he wasn't one of the 50 families, he was one of the 100. Uh, and he got up there and was doing just what Makochti was telling him to do. And then I was taking a picture of them because I was taking a picture of them. And Makoti looked at me and he said, this is the new Guatemala. And I said, how? And he said, it's a rich, young Ladino man respecting Maya ways and taking orders from a poor old Indian man. And he said, this is the new Guatemala. So I have that picture blown up and it's on my office wall. Uh, but these are the kinds of ways in which we have interacted with our host culture. So, you know, we've been talking about interculturality. So clearly the gringos are doing things to adapt to the communities that are our host communities. But of course our host communities are also adapting to us. And one of the things that we are doing is providing a model of successful co-living, of the possibility of having respect on both sides of the language and culture divide. One of the things we do, of course, is to teach routines. We all do this, right? It's important to learn how to be polite. It's important to do all these things the right way. Uh, but you know, we sometimes lose sight of how important those things are culturally. One of the things we do in uh, Maya communities is after a meal, everybody who's sitting together eating thanks the other people at the table. But you've got to do it right. You have to start with the most prestigious person at the table and then go down. And sometimes that's purely by age. The oldest is the most respected. Sometimes there are things that break that. So if you have someone who's the head of a cofradilla, they outrank people who might be a little older than them at the table. So you've got to know all these cultural features so that you can get up from the table. So one year, we were actually not in a Cachicel town. We were across the lake in uh, San Pedro de la Laguna, which is a Tzutuhil town, and we were having supper in a restaurant. And then, you know, all right, we already done that. We were a lot of people. And so it takes a long time. You have to do it one by one. Stand up and thank everybody in order. And so we were doing that. And there were other tourists in the town. And, they were, and then they got really impatient because the 
Tutu Hill wait staff stopped. And they stood there with their arms crossed, which is a reverential position, and waited until we had all thanked everybody else. And some of the tourists got really upset. And the waiters turned to them and said, be quiet, this is really important. So you know, that routine was important for us, but it was also important for the Tsutuhia. Uh, a, a place where we didn't show so well was in Solola, which is a Kakchikel town, where we were having lunch together and then everybody was going away for the weekend to their respective places. So a lot of the young teachers wanted to hit the road, Jack, and we had had a, a talk from a Kofrade leader, and he was at the table with us, so he should have been thanked first. And these young people stood up and they said, Matthias Chinua Iwanohet, thanks everybody. And they were about to head out the door. And he stood up and he sat him down and he said, this is how you do it. And he went through and he told all of us how to thank everyone, even though he didn't know us by name, but he went through and did it correctly. These become the basis for creating shared understandings, but also shared respect, right? So we all do this all the time, but we need to be aware, especially when we're in the host country, that people are watching what we do, right? And as we do things and do them correctly, then other people begin to think about their values Sometimes they say, well, this is something really good that we do, and sometimes they think, well, huh? I don't know. Maybe we should think about doing this in uh, a different way. And of course, you share different genres of, of things. At one point, I wanted to give um, a paper at the AAAs on Maya joke telling. And I wanted to do this because it, it was right after the signing of the peace accords, and there was all this stuff about the genocide and all of the Maya that had been killed. And it was all doom and gloom. And yes, all of that happened. But I wanted to emphasize that the Maya maintained a positive, let's get it done attitude. And they have really um, poignant jokes about life, even the parts that aren't that good. And I wanted to give papers on this. And the panel was rejected as frivolous. So we didn't get to give the panel, but it started because I was getting data in the cat class the year before. So I would start these uh, joke-telling rounds. And I got lots of wonderful jokes, but it started to tradition. So now in the course, it breaks. Everybody stands around and tells jokes. So if I ever need to give that paper again, I've got great data. I have great data on this. Um, so um, one thing I wanted to uh, talk about, and I know we're getting light on time, is this idea that we have created family. And one of the issues that happens when you take people into uh, lesser developed countries, shall we say, is sometimes host families are reluctant to take the gringo because they think this gringo needs a flush toilet. Who knows what they eat? But luckily we've had this course running for so many years that they realized that gringos will eat boiled greens. Uh, and some families that have had cross-cultural groups will say, gringos eat boiled greens better than people from France. No, no, no offense to any French speakers here. Uh, but we have that confidence now to bring people into homes and to have that sharing. Sharing is what it's all about. All of our people uh, in the course do research projects as part of the course, but these research projects are also co-defined with the Kachikel instructors. They aren't just a gringo or a Ladino coming in and say, I want to learn this. Rather, they are ideas and problems that come out of interchange with the instructors so that they decide on what's important and work on finding out about that together. <clears throat> so I want to uh, just close, and I think I'm, cl yeah, I'm getting close to time, uh, with talking a little bit, going back to the idea of the galactic polities and the idea that this is founded on 
uh, kind of philosophical or spiritual tradition. The basic Maya principles, if we had to boil it down, are probably this, that everything in the universe is alive, every part of the universe feels and speaks, and every individual has strengths and weaknesses, and they will do better in life if they follow their strengths. So one of the things we try to do in the course is to help everyone the students, the teachers, the communities in which we work, the communities from which we come, to find those strengths and weaknesses and to build on the strengths. So uh, I would point out that the knowledges that come out of this course are knowledges that have been co-created. We read scholarship that was done by uh, Americans and by nationals and basically extracted from the communities, not given back. Our teachers then can return to their communities and share that knowledge with the communities, and it, we can criticize the knowledge. Was this true when it was written? Is it true now? What do we know from a Maya perspective? So let's say this particular uh, pulsating galactic classroom is but one of many. All of y'all's classrooms, I'm sure, also pulsate. They have different philosophical underpinnings, they have different political and social demands on them that they have to meet, and they have different degrees of insertion within their communities. But the language classrooms and their host and target communities are spaces in which the language teachers are models and mentors to create safe spaces for their students, for the language, for the interchange, so that everyone has the freedom to think things that they haven't thought before. Not just the gringos, not just the teachers, but everyone involved in the process. And it's the creation of this living, learning community, we've all heard that before, uh, that defines new futures. You all are aware that the world is going to end on December 21st, 2012. No. Okay. The December 21st, 2012 is the dawn of the new Bakhtun will go into the next era of um, time. The Maya are hoping for a new dawn. And it's from such pulsating galactic classrooms that we can expand into that new dawn. Thank you. Okay, the question was, what is, what is the range of the language? Uh, the language itself depend. this is something, again, that's highly political, is how you count numbers of speakers on a language. There's a wonderful book called Maya, Mayas y Ladinos en Cifras, Mayas and Ladinos in Numbers, which talks about how counts are political. Because the government wants there always to be fewer. And then activists, linguists, educators want the numbers to reflect how many people actually need materials. So by generous count, you could say that there are perhaps a million Kachikel speakers. They live in four departments in Guatemala. However, this course isn't just talking about the Kachikel, but talking about the Maya cultural heritage. So we try each year to hit one big Maya site. And the early days, hitting the big sites was probably more important for the teachers than it was for the students, because the students had other ways of getting there. The students could pay $33 on Aviateca and get to the Peten and go to Tikal and go to Washaktun. But for the Maya, it was either, uh, back in that time, the boats weren't paid yet, so it was a two-day bus trip and without having money to pay for accommodations on the other end, and they were not going to come up with 33 US dollars, although it was a cheaper fare for uh, nationals. So it was most important to them that they were actually at one of the huge classic Maya sites. The first time we went there, every male teacher had a backpack full of material to burn, because that's what you do at Maya ceremonies, you burn stuff. 
So they had their backpacks loaded with different kinds of incense and, and candles. They went to the main plaza at Tikal, and they hit every temple. They would hit the ground, they would run up these temples, which is a feat in itself. They would run to the top, and they would build a fire. And the guards were just going, whoa, what's this? Uh, you don't build fires on top of the temple. They didn't stop them. Now, of course, enough Maya are trying to do ceremony that the preservation people have said, let's not burn it up here in the temples. We'll make you some nice little concrete platforms down in the plaza where you can burn. Uh, but like, we were kind of the first up there doing it. And this was extremely important for the teachers. So we have been to Copan. We've been to Tikal. And we regularly go to Ishimche, which is the pre-contact Kapchikel capital. And it's, of course, now in ruins like every Maya classic. Well, not every Maya classic site. The Chu who live on top of their classic site. Uh, but we try to include these parts of the heritage. And this is important, I know, it's a long answer to a relatively simple question. Uh, it's important to include this part of Maya trajectory with the Kachikel because for many years, the official line of the government was to detach the Maya from their history. It got reappropriated as part of Ladino history. And I have heard, and I'm sure Linda can back me up, you hear Ladino say, you know, yes, they were the classic Maya who were great, and we respect them. You can see their stila and their monuments on our money. But, you know, who, who knows how they're related to these people today? What we have today are pobres inditos, you know, saber de dónde vienen. They're just these poor Indians, and they, don't, they are detached from their own history. So reconnecting is extremely important. They've been taught lies. Fourth grade textbooks until 1992 contained statements that said the Maya were naked before the Spanish arrived. So when the Maya actually got to see Stila, from these sites and saw the incredible uh, wardrobes that the leaders had on, this was extremely important. And we went with uh, Sak Balam, who was then the head of the Academy of Mayan Languages, and he stood in front of a stela that showed a woman in a huge floor length wipil and said, look, she has clothes on. And he wasn't as impressed with the fact that some of the designs are designs that are still replicated in the weavings today, as he was by the fact that she had clothes on. You know, so there is a tremendous importance to bringing back that connection, not only for the Americans who are used to it, right? We're used to thinking of present-day indigenous people as connected to indigenous pasts. But in Guatemala, this is a new an empowering thing to be connected. This is the Qamil symbol, which is the symbol with which all light side ceremonies begin. <laughs> it represents a seed, and it's from that seed that we hope that these new understandings will grow. I just had to say that because that's the last slide. Great question. Z. OK, uh, so the first question was to talk a little bit about the one-on-one -on -one model, <clears throat> which I'll do in just a second. and then the. Second one was about the question of standardization and is there resistance on the part of the uh, speakers who, of course, speak a local variety. You know, the standard in Kashikel is a lot like the standard in English. Nobody speaks standard English. Some of us come close, or we can come close when we're trying. Uh, but it's not anybody's native variety, with the possible exception of my college roommate. Um, but her two parents were both high school school teachers, so what can you say? All right. Um, but to go back to the one-on-one, -on -one, what I, I didn't really talk much about how the course is developed, but we have a one-to-one -one ratio. But the way the class starts is um, the teachers do a dramatization of whatever it is the lesson is. And sometimes as many as half of the teachers will be enacting what's going on. And the other half are strategically located among the students. So students are going, what? You know, they can get the little murmur in the ear. We try to avoid the murmur in the ear being in Spanish. We try to insist on it all being in Cachicao.
Okay, so the first is a dramatization. Then after the dramatization, you have modeling by the leader for that lesson, and the lesson leaders change every time, of what the kinds of questions that are going to be asked are. Now the students now have, have the textbook, so presumably, except for the first day of course, presumably they have already read ahead and know what the lesson is and know what the target vocabulary is. But the teacher then asks questions of the participants in the skit and then of the teachers that are scattered around so that they model what the questions are and what answers to those questions are going to sound like. Then they, we do the, you know, ask people questions that they can respond to without speaking. Just get up and do something that shows that you understood the question. Then they ask them questions for which they say just yes or no so they don't have to produce anything. Then they ask them questions where the answer is vocabulary they already have, which works great except for the first day. And then uh, they finally ask them questions to which they can respond with the target vocabulary. So there's this kind of gradated progression. Then, when you feel like, oh, yeah, don't ask me anything else about this because I've heard it five times, uh, we break and then we go, what we, we say, we go to the patio. And we actually physically do go to the patio in the house. But, you know, if you weren't doing it somewhere that had a patio, you could go anywhere. But here, we started off doing it one-on-one -on -one the, in the patio work. So there was one teacher and one student. But the students felt intimidated. How am I going to talk to this person for 20 minutes? You know, with my limited vocabulary. So now we have one or two teachers and one or two students. So the student feels they have an ally that can help them get through that conversational period. And we try to kind of match the levels of the student so we don't put a really, really strong person with a weak person because we found that the really strong person knows it and they just can't wait for the other person to produce the word. Uh, so we try to kind of pair people at the same levels for this patio work. And then you get the much longed for Coke break after, after that. And then you re, you know, you rejoin the class. We do two lessons a morning in this fashion. And then we end with a game period. And the games always involve the recent vocabulary. And we've been helped in that some in, in industrious Kafchikels have done things like created bingo games for uh, Kachikel numbers, for the day signs, for animals. And so you can play bingo and people get treats. And it's amazing how competitive people can be for a little piece of candy. And then we also do the thing where if we play like Simon Says with verbs, and if you do the wrong thing, you have to do you know, some kind of penalty, so you have to act something out by yourself. And what's really amazing to me about this is that the gringos usually don't mess up. It's usually the teachers. So the teachers are having to do all these little, you know, but it's something that everybody is, is playing together, so you get that kind of use. And then, of course, in the afternoons, we do cultural activities, we go out into the communities, we interact with people in the communities. So we do try, if we have to go someplace on a bus, we you know, do sit teacher, student, teacher, student, teacher, student, so that when you're interacting with the environment, you're, you're getting the input there in Kachikel. You know, so the one-to-one -one ratio is very important, but it's not this kind of sit down together and look at a book or something like that. It's a very dynamic. Did I answer the other question? Okay, great. Yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, if I can rephrase the the question, I'm going to rephrase the question generally. Right. So, if you're going to a country where there are indigenous languages and Spanish is the hegemonic or the dominant language, and you're trying to prepare to go, clearly Spanish is going to get you further, right? Because, of course, you know, going to are you Bolivia? Going to Bolivia, uh, you're only, well, there are several indigenous languages, but the big ones are uh, Quechua and Aymara, you know. But it's hard to get on top of the variety. If you wanted to learn 
to go all over Guatemala, there are 22 Mayan languages, not to talk about the different varieties of um, those languages. There are 22 different languages, plus Xinka and Garifuna. Of course, Xinka is only spoken by about five really, really old men. But uh, it wouldn't be worth your while to try to learn all the indigenous languages, and Spanish is definitely a language that most people will be able to understand. You're not going to be able to reach everyone in Spanish. You know, and uh, what we often find with people who are particularly interested in doing development work in Guatemala is they take the course, and it's more important to them to be able to do the greeting routines and to be able to do the, the very important things like say thank you after the meal that are the, the cultural icons so that they can deploy those in a way that says, look, I'm trying to accommodate to you. I respect your culture and I'm giving, this is the best that I can do. There's so much research on this, like Taylor and Borges and others in Quebec have seen that um, if you're trying to accommodate, even if you do it poorly, you're evaluated more positively than someone who actually speaks the language very well but doesn't show cultural respect. So uh, I would encourage you to learn Spanish and then when you get there, if you learn just a few routines, that sign of respect is going to be very important. <laughs> well, let, let, me, let me skirt the question of how much Spanish is enough by saying in our course, uh, when you fill out the application form, and y'all should all fill out the application form. In our course, when you fill out the application form, we ask that you have enough Spanish. And I have a little scale that starts with Tarzan Spanish, which is yo hablar usted entender, right? And if you can do the yo hablar usted entender, then you're all right. Um, and, and of course, I, I have an uncle who spoke uh, Spanish Throughout his life, he lived in Honduras and in Ecuador for 40 years of that life, and he always hablared así. Um, what can I say? He married uh, Bolivian, you know, but you know, the important thing is, is more, not, and that sounds terrible from a language teacher, uh, but it's more important to show the proper respect and the proper attitude than it is to show the proper verb form. Yes. Um, the question was how to navigate the internal review board during those contexts, and it was very uh, tricky for Guatemala. Uh, luckily, we're working right now with the Universidad del Valle de Guatemala uh, to have joint proposals so that there's some screening in country as well. Um, and this, that part is it we're working on right now, which is to say that I've been doing work in Guatemala since 1973 and uh, doing it only with US review. You know, so I think it's very important to get the internal review from the host country as well. But we're just now being able to uh, work on mechanisms to set it up with the host country as well. But within Tulane, you know, we have the internal review process. And one of the things that causes us uh, difficulty, which I'm sure you have all met, is informed consent. Right? And particularly, less, less of a problem now because uh, presumably the genocidal war is over, although with our current president, who knows? Not Obama. Uh, Otto Perez Molina, but uh, people are less reluctant to sign something than they were during the years of genocide. Uh, however, we have worked out an understanding with Tulane Internal Review that oral consent is sufficient. However, as you know, for any kind of um, research, it's very important that you have community buy-in and that the stakeholders aren't just the 
graduate students and the students in Guatemala who are going to get theses or who are going to get papers out of the work. And I would just put in a plug, of, I mentioned the sacred sites research, and I would say that um, for the last three years, unsuccessfully each year, I don't know, but for the last three years there has been um, a law proposed to Congress to protect and define Maya sacred sites, which has been informed by the interim reports from this research. So we're working very hard to have that kind of interchange both with the host communities and up here. But it requires educating the internal review board as well, right, for your institution. Because, I mean, they know me now because I've been writing these things every summer for 11,000 years. But uh, it, it does require a great deal of attention because you have to protect people. You especially have to protect them in countries where, as it has been until very recently, an educated Maya has a big target on them. And I will say that Maya are still being disappeared. The, about once a month, that gives you how many daykeepers have been killed since the beginning of each year. So um, the, the war for the hearts and minds of Guatemalans is, is certainly not over. And of course, what this course tries to do is, is move that beyond the battle of a limited group of people who feel that no one knows them, no one knows about them, no one knows anything about what's happening to them, to a more international focus.